Hi guys, in this lecture we're going to be doing hypothesis tests and confidence intervals for comparing two means from independent samples. Some motivation and basic conceptual ideas are, very basically, that we want to compare two population means. So remember, the pretty universally accepted symbol for the mean is mu, so as you see this throughout the slides, know that we're talking about the mean. Now what you're going to notice as we start going through some of this stuff is that I'm going to be using some subscripting. The reason for this, why this is necessary, is because we have two groups. You could call it group one and group two. And we want to compare these guys. So whatever you see one and two, just know that this is just the conventional or generic way of attributing that kind of um, the group distinction to the mean. All right. So, once again, we're comparing two population means. We're taking independent random samples from each of the populations. This is important. Okay, so we're going to end up with two random samples that are independent, one from each of those two groups or populations. We're going to compute x bar from each of the two samples that we collect we're going to use those to estimate the mean from that particular group or population okay and then ultimately we want to compare mu1 to mu2 and the way we're going to start is we're going to start by assuming that mu1 equals mu2 it's a nice position to start and see whether the data shows us otherwise another way to write this is just mu1 minus mu2 equals 0. That's just saying there's no difference, right? So naturally, the position to start is to take the two x bars that we computed from the independent samples and get the difference. This is going to serve as our point estimate of what we really would like to know, which is the difference of these two. OK, and that's basic. That, those are the basic conceptual ideas. All right, now in execution, when we conduct a hypothesis test, there's a couple things you need to look out for with the technique that I'm showing you here today. The method I'm showing here today, you need both sample sizes to be at least 30 or both populations to be normally distributed or some combination of the two. Okay, if that's satisfied, then the null hypothesis is going to be that the difference is zero. That's going to be our starting position 99 out of 100 times. And the alternative hypothesis is going to be one of three, either the two-sided alternative or one of the one-sided alternatives. This is saying that they're just different. This is saying that the mean of group one is greater than group two. All right? And this last one is saying that the mean of group one is less than the mean of group two. Okay, you could write it like this, or you could write it like this. Uh, some texts use uh, one of these, and others use this. So uh, just understand that they're saying the same thing. Now, the test statistic is a t test statistic, and it's computed as follows. It's kind of involved. Okay. This will follow roughly a t distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the minimum of the two sample sizes minus 1. So if the sample sizes are 150 and 240, the minimum is 150, then you do minus 1, so that's 149. That would be the degrees of freedom. Now this is not, let me warn you, this is not the exact degrees of freedom. Okay, so if you're working on a problem and you need the exact correct answer, this is not the way to do it. You can look into the formula to do that. I'll append it to the description of these of this video. However, this is the quick and dirty way to do it. It will give you the same. It will give you a conservative conclusion. In other words, what I mean is. If you use this method versus the exact degrees of, of the f freedom, you will reject HO when you reject with the, with the exact degrees of freedom. Okay, So you won't ever make a decision of rejecting the null hypothesis using this method. 
if you weren't going to be rejecting it with the exact degrees of freedom. So look in the description to see that it's a rather involved formula to get the degrees of freedom. Okay, so I prefer this quick and easy way to get the degrees of freedom. All right, but more importantly, we, we're dealing with a t-test statistic, so we're going to be using a t-table. Okay, and we're going to be getting cutoffs. Okay, so we're going to use the cutoff method, which you've already seen. Okay, as opposed to the p-value. If you have access to a computer, you can also get a p-value easily. But if you're taking a course where you don't have access to computers in the on the exam, you'll, the cutoff method is an equivalent method. Now, the confidence interval, also very easy to compute. The confidence interval for the difference between mu1 and mu2 is computed as such. You take the point estimate and you add and subtract the margin of error. Before you do any of this, make sure that same condition that you checked for the hypothesis test is satisfied. Both sample sizes are at least 30 or both populations normally distributed. If so, this is the method for coming up with a confidence interval. Okay, here's the T multiplier. You're used to seeing this now. And here is the standard error, which is an estimate of the standard deviation of the point estimate. Okay, S of course is, is uh, S squared is of course sample variance. So with the subscript of one, that means sample one variance, sample two variance, sample size one, sample size two. And this, of course, is the t multiplier you get from the t table with a c percent confidence level, 90, 95, 99, whatever it may be. Okay? And the degrees of freedom arrived in the same way that we, we just talked about on the previous slide. All right, let's look at an example. Do children with ADHD have smaller brains by volume than children without this condition? Okay? So we're measuring volume probably by centimeters cubed. Okay? Brain scans are performed on 152 children with and 339 without ADHD. The results are as follows. So here we go. We got nicely organized in a table. I'm going to call this group one, call this group two. And um, so anywhere you see subscripting later on, you know how I did it. You don't have to do it like this. You could flip these, just stay consistent. Uh, sample size 1, sample size 2, x bar 1, x bar 2, standard deviation 1, standard deviation 2. So we're given the standard deviations. Okay, so be careful. You might need to compute the variance at some point or not, but just know what you're given. Now let's just go back to that question. Do children with ADHD have smaller brain volumes than children without? So since I called with ADHD group 1, so we're saying is the mean brain volume of this group smaller than this group. So this is the alternative hypothesis that we need to work with. Now, some texts will write it like this, but just so you know, this is going to be this equivalent to saying this. So either of these two alternatives, I mean, they're the same thing. They're just written in different ways, and some people prefer one to the other. Have your pick, okay? Now, uh, that's question A. So that's going to be the alternative. The null, of course, is that they're going to be equal. In the next slide, I've actually worked it out, so you can uh, take a look at that. Take a second and try this. Also try B, which is con con constructing a 95% confidence interval for the difference between these two groups, okay? So do that. By the way, uh, significance level 0.05. All right, now I'm gonna flip to the next slide. You can pause here, work on the problem, then check your work. Here's the work, okay? So step one, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. Step one, state the hypothesis test. You see the alternative is exactly what we talked about in the previous slide, okay, alpha 0.05. We checked a large sample condition, check, both sample sizes are well above 30. We get the cutoffs, why? Because we get a cutoff, sorry, why? Because this is a one-tailed test, okay? 
It's a one tail test. And remember I gave you this little mnemonic that this kind of points to the tail where the rejection region should fall. So it's going to be a left tail test or lower tail test. Okay. Um, we get the degrees of freedom, which is the minimum of the two minus one. So 152 minus one, 139 minus one, the minimum is 139. Uh, so minus one, 138. So we're looking at a T distribution with 138 degrees of freedom. Now, when you go to the table, you might not have 138 degrees of freedom. So I suggest always to go lower. For my students, I strongly recommend they go lower. Um, the reason for going lower in the degrees of freedom is that if you were to reject the null hypothesis with a lower degrees of freedom, then you would have definitely rejected it with the correct degrees of freedom. Okay? So here's this picture. Here's a T distribution with 138 degrees of freedom. I'm, I'm pretty sure when I worked on this, the table I give my students did not have 138 degrees. And so I probably had to drop down to the next lowest, which was probably 100 degrees of freedom. So 